All right, Casey Abrams. It's good to good to talk to you. Haven't seen you in a while. Been a while, Jeff. Last time I saw you, we were uh, eating burgers and uh, drinking the biggest shake with cookies on top of it. I think, right? Oh yeah, the Black Tap Burger in Manhattan. Yeah. Do you remember? What, what, it wasn't cookies. Was it cupcakes? What did they put on top of it? You got, I think, the pretzel one, and oh, I okay. got birthday cake. Oh, okay. I think we we tried each other's too. It was really good. Really good place. Yeah, I mean, not super healthy, but every once in a while, it's good to stop in there. Yeah, thanks for taking me. Yeah, I mean, you had an interesting, I mean, we've all had an interesting year of it this year, but you were specifically on tour when everything started sort of coming apart. I was very lucky in the fact that um, th- that I was in the middle of a tour rather than about to do a tour or didn't get to do one. But uh, yeah, I was in the middle of... of uh, of the jazz tour doing, you know, promoting the jazz album. And we, we, we had just released a couple more uh, songs, I think four or five more songs for the EP. Yeah. And I, and I, I'm very lucky cause I got to play in New York. That was one of my last places. And, um, and it was crazy because I, I, I remember um, I had some special guests on and uh, Ksenia came up this really awesome Russian singer and actress. And she kind of, as a joke, gave me a um what's it called uh, a, a surgical mask you know she was like hey coronavirus is happening so here's wow. a here's a surgical mask and everyone laughed and we turned it into a joke but now it's it's taken over the world it's crazy and then i remember the last tour date i did was in toronto it was international i'm very lucky that was my first and last time doing uh an international uh canada date doing my own stuff so it was mm-hmm. really cool I mean, it's like, do you remember, I don't know if you follow sports at all, but when Rudy Gobert and the NBA got, was one of the first people to get it and he had a press conference about it and he ended up touching all the microphones as a joke. <laughs> and then oh my gosh. It's only yeah. now in hindsight, we look back I'm like, oh, that, that yeah, has whoops. not aged well. Yeah. That's horrible. I, yeah. I remember when Tom Hanks got it, was it, was that kind of around the same time? No, like Tom Hanks was after because I mean, when because like you were sort of talking about, we all sort of didn't understand the seriousness of it. When Tom Hanks got it, I think he was one of the first people where we we're like, oh, wait a minute, Tom Hanks. Yeah. Like, hold on now. That's... Yeah, it picked a pretty big person to to inhabit. So, yeah, yeah. It was so everyone could know about it. So, yeah. So how, how many shows did you get in on? The, um, so the, the EP is uncovered. How many of the uncovered tour dates did you actually get to get through? Um, I'm going to say about six. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I remember we did five in a row. It was crazy. I remember we did the first show was New York city and I drove all the way across country with my van. So I, I, I felt really good that I didn't have to like fly, but anyway, I, yeah. So it was New York city, then the hard rock cafe at, um, uh, in Pittsburgh, I think. And then another place in, um, um, in New York as well, New York state, Toronto, of course. Um, there was another place too. And I can't remember, but I remember we were about to do Staten Island that got cut, but yeah, I think it was, I remember we did five dates in a row. Then we took a day and a, a two days, and we went to Toronto and that was our last day. So I think it was about six. It was about half of the tour. So let me take you back a little bit further, a lot further to young Casey, we, we Casey. When did you decide that you wanted to be a musician? What fostered that? Was there a moment that's like, oh, oh, that thing, I want to do that. Or was it just something that sort of gradually happened? Um. Yeah, it gradually happened. But I think I think music has always been in my soul. My parents would always play like oldies, 104.3 in Chicago. We would listen to like the 50s and 60s, like Beach Boys, um, uh, The Temptations, uh, Beatles, that kind of stuff. So I, I would listen to it in the car and I would always sing along. And I would always not only sing, but I would harmonize. And, and the fact that I could harmonize meant that I was into the orchestration of things. And that's, you know, I started to uh, copy uh, TV show theme songs like Pokemon 
and the Jigglypuff theme of Pokemon, you know, and then Adam's family. I got into that stuff and just started playing it and things that I loved, I would copy through music. So I would, so I started learning piano and then, um, and then I would, ha we were all kind of, we had to learn a recorder in school. And so I moved to clarinet because it's kind of the same thing. Recorder, you play upwards like this and then clarinet's the same. And then I remember my, my piano teacher up in Idlewild, California, Robin Rabins. She, she, I was learning piano from her, but she also played the bass. So I, I picked it up and I was like, this is my, this is my love right here, right here. It's good. But yeah, no, it's, it's always, it's always been there since, since I can remember. I, I don't ever remember thinking, oh, maybe I should go into music. It's always been, I'm going to be in music. I feel like the bass is never the, the, the instrument people start off with because I'm, I, mean, I would also, if I have an instrument primarily of my own, it would also be bass. And that was not the first instrument. I feel like most often it comes down to like, well, who's left? Who wants to play bass? People aren't rushing to play bass. I That's what, what happened that with Paul McCartney. Right. It's like, all right, well, I'll, I guess I'll play bass by default. I feel like happens a lot. And I wonder why that is. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a hard instrument. And uh, nobody know, really knows what it is until you hear it and hear what it does. Or until it's not there, do you realize what right. it is? Right. And that's the, that's the hard part. I mean, I'm a singer and a bass player at the same time, so I'm different. But, you know, uh, I've, I've always heard that the best way to, to know if the bass player is like a good bass player is if you don't know that he's there. So that's, that's the big part. You know, because until, until someone messes up the bass line, whoopsie, then, oh, there's a, I guess there is a bass player there, you know, because you don't really know what it is. It's, it's literally the, the, the bowl that holds the jelly of the melody. So obviously a lot of people become aware of you during American Idol. Can you mm -hmm. talk to me about the, the baby steps of getting there? What made you want to try out? Or was it someone that suggested you do it, the peer pressure side, or was it just you watched before and wanted to do it? Uh, I'd seen it before and I've always thought that oh, I could do that. And then my mom would play, uh, I remember it was season, season eight and season nine of American Idol. And, and I, I just remember it's like, oh, these, these guys have guitars now. They're, they're changing up the, they're changing up the whole style. I could do that. I could, maybe I could just bring my bass on. And this was at the end of uh, my college years. I only had one semester and I hated college and uh, I dropped out and then I dropped out and just started uh, practicing. I remember there what was you idol auditions. What? What were you studying? I was studying uh, jazz bass. Oh, okay. Yeah. At least that, like, that, it's not like architecture or something. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I was sticking to music. And I, before that I had been to Idlewild Arts, which is a great, it's, it's, a, it's better than most colleges because it's a, it's, it's, it's a boarding arts high school and it has really good programming. And, and uh, I got to sing at coffee houses and talent shows too. So I got to sing and play the bass. They let your creative mind be what it is. And uh, yeah, so, so I didn't like college. I started watching Idol during college. I showed my friends American Idol during college. I was like, yo, check this out. I'm going to try this out. You know, they're like, all right, cool. You know, they believed in me. It was really cool. And uh, then the next year I tried it and, and I was very lucky. So you developed a lot of relationships that seem to have been enduring based off of conversations I've heard you had with other people, but it seems like the one that's been a great musical co um, companion for you ever since has been Haley Reinhardt. Can you talk oh, yeah. a little bit about why that is and what, why you think you have such a good dynamic together? Um, yeah, it's crazy. We just, we just released a song free as a bird. It's on, uh, all the platforms and I, I, uh, edited a video to it and we, we produced it in LA. I I'm in Arizona now. I drove out there, but yeah, I, I think the dynamic is, is that we just love, we're kind of yin and yang, you know? Um, I'm very just, you know, do whatever I want and kind of rough around the edges and so, and, and so is she, but she's very like sweet, you know, it's kind of the sweet and roughness. And we love jazz. We, we both studied jazz. We grew up with jazz. 
Um, we have the same humor, which can be seen in our shows too. You know, when we're, you know, that's, that's part, that's part of it. If we can, if we can make each other laugh, if we can sing and harmonize and it's, it's magic. And, and that's the thing also is, you know, it, we'll, we'll, we'll not practice for a show and she'll just come in and she's completely confident. And I think I am too. We're just confident that we're going to harmonize together and hit notes that we don't even know uh, exist, you know, like even if we hit the same note, we're going to laugh. We're going to move on. We know how to have a good time on stage. And it's, it's just, I think we, we share that mutual having fun on stage. And she featured on your first post idol release also, right? The yeah, Concord yeah, album. She, yeah. We've been on a lot of our, uh, our, uh, records together. Yeah. She, she, uh, she came in and she did hit the road jack. We did hit the road jack and right. it's been doing pretty well too. Yeah. And so you finish idol, you have the first record, which tends to lean a little bit more pop. And then mm -hmm. with the first Chesky release, you go in a little bit of a different direction. Can you talk about being approached by us slash Chesky, how that process came to be? Yeah. I, I, well, I know that John Burke and, uh, uh, Norm Chesky are pretty close and maybe even David, I think, but yeah, Norm, I remember hit me up Norm Chesky and, and I, I love Norm because he's, he's so passionate and adamant about just, just, uh, art, art in general and jazz. And I remember he called, we were on a conference call. And, and it was really nice. It was really humbling. He kept telling me over and over again, he's like, man, I saw you on Idol. It was great. You played that bass. You told Jimmy Iovine to go screw himself. And you did a, a Nature Boy. And you did George on my mind. And you did jazz stuff. And uh, it, it, it made me very happy to hear him say that. And, uh, and he said, yeah, just come, come to me when you're in New York. Or I can't remember. Maybe he, he flew us out, right? Is that what happened? Mm -hmm. You remember? Yeah, okay. I do. Yeah. But that was crazy. It was it was a great experience uh, meeting him, and yeah, he just he kind of he kind of you could tell he was a boss. You know, he had that boss mentality, but he was super nice, and he and we still we still talk to this day. He he's a great guy, and yeah, he 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 was just like, let's make something jazz, and I remember he was like, let's do I don't know some jazz, some pop. So I brought in some pop songs and we kind of made it a jazzy pop version of them. And then I also did some, some jazz, uh, some jazz standards as well. And that was like the real, really the first time that I had ever done jazz and put it out as a record, you know? So what would you classify? Let's make out. Uh, jazz rock. Yeah. Just I'm a romantic say. ballad. Yeah, yeah, I could, you can say it's a jazz rock ballad. And then the other one, I guess would be, I'd be curious to hear your sort of classification on would be Cougar Town. Yeah, jazz rock. Nonfiction, just straight nonfiction. <laughs> Which one's the real one again? Is it nonfiction is real, right? Nonfiction is real, correct. Yeah, nonfiction, yeah. So, I mean, is that a story that you care to share? Well, I mean, I, wrote, I really wrote the song. There's a couple different experiences and there's a couple different women in my life. But um, the, the reason that I even thought it was acceptable, because I was a little nervous using the word cougar, because I, I was like, well, is that derogatory? But I remember there was one show where th these old, beautiful, white-haired ladies came in and they were wearing my shirt which is this shirt. It's the smiley face. And they came in and they were wearing that shirt. And they said, they, they handed me like some food and they were like, we love you, Casey. And we are Casey's Cougars. We're, we started our own fan club. And I was like, Whoa, that's, I don't know. I felt, I felt so good about it. You know, that all generations were listening to my music. And uh, so I, I felt, I felt I needed to write a song about it. And then, you know, over time, you know, at the shows, there would be some, there'd be some older women that would come up to me and say, Hey, let's hang out. And so this, I was like, this is just a fun experience. I, I'm going to write a song about it. And I did. Okay. Yeah. A little creative license then with the 
with where the song goes. Yeah. Um, so then with your second Chesky record, you go in more of a traditional jazz direction that I think more is more akin to what you had discussed with Norman. Can you talk a little bit about some of the players on that and also some of the song choices that you made? Uh, well, it's funny because Norm said, hey, pick some jazz songs that you like. And I picked them and we approved them. And then I remember uh, the day before, he was like, all right, do you need me to print out the lyrics? And I was like, oh, some of those jazz songs have lyrics? And they're like, yeah, we, we want you to sing on it mostly. And I was like, oh, I thought there was going to be a couple instrumental songs. So I kind of was um, kind of learning them at the last minute. But at the same time, that's what jazz is. It's keeping it fresh. You know, um, if, if you go in too rehearsed, it's going to sound too rehearsed. If you go in fresh, it's going to sound fresh. And I remember, uh, yeah, Mark Whitfield, who I still hang, you know, talk to to this day. He's, he's an awesome guitar player. He really killed it. And just, we vibed so well, so well. He, we, we, our timing was the same. Our melodic sensibility was the same. And he was in the same place. You know, I think that we were supposed to practice maybe the day before, but we couldn't. So we just practiced the day of and we recorded all the songs. Um, and then Givton, Gifton Gellin was, was killing it. He's, he's, he's a really great student that's going to kill it in life. And he killed it on the trumpet. And then uh, the great Jimmy Green, he was killing it on the saxophone. He was giving it the heart and soul. I love that guy. And it was really cool. I got to see these guys um, at live performances and they were just super, not only are they great musicians, but they're super nice. And then, and, and, oh, what's, the flute player, she was great. And she's Ann been, to, I, I've seen her, Ann Drummond, thank you. But man, she killed it on the flute. I think she's like classically trained, but man, her jazz chops are amazing. She took some great solos that were super beautiful and surprisingly delightful, you know? Yeah, and and th that that team just felt super jazzy. And there was there was no piano player, no drummer. It was just me on bass and singing and getting to jam with these real jazz musicians. Why Don't You Do Right from that session has become one of your more popular songs and enduring songs. Why do you think that that is? What is it about that song that you think fits you? Um, why don't you do right? I don't know. It's this very sexy song. <laughs> you know, you, you think about Jessica Rabbit and Roger Rabbit and you're like, this is hot. So maybe that's what people, maybe people are just imagining me in a red dress and bunny ears. That's probably what it is. Well, if they weren't before, they probably are now. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, I think that's one of those songs that you bring up an interesting point with Jessica Rabbit. I think it's, that's for our generation where our head goes with that but then for the, like norman's generation that's probably the furthest thing from their mind <laughs> so i wonder if it's be, there is something about that song that sort of has been passed down through the ages to people that helps it transcend and keep living i think there's an attitude about it where it's you know give me your money and get out of here but also make love to me you know that's 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 such a i think people like getting slapped around every once in a while you know what what do you think is your favorite song that you personally have written um i'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say uh it's the song called stuck in london and it, i wrote it in london and it's 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 the the chorus is you and me uh eating mangoes in a mango tree and there's something about food. I just love writing about food. But yeah, it's, it's all about mangoes and being stuck in London and just imagining your, your favorite, your, your favorite imagine, imagination, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's, that's I, I probably, I, and I probably get called out to do that song a lot. But yeah, the Mango Tree song, Stuck in London, is, is probably my favorite one that I've ever written. And I'll, I'll listen to it in the car and I'll still get chills and it feels great. The other question I like to ask people is not like the question, not the song that they wish they wrote, but a song that they heard that instantly made them think that, oh, someone like crawled inside my head and wrote this song. Like it sound, it feels like something I would have written. I just didn't. Is there one of those that you ever, you listen to the radio and you're like, man, that, 
that is me in a song. How did they, how did they get in here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what comes to mind is and maybe this is just cause I was inspired by it, mm-hmm. but Radiohead's everything in its right place. That's a really good one. And it just, I love that it's an odd time signature and it's so soothing. I'm trying to think of some other ones though. Maybe we are the champions. Cause you're a some champion. Really great, great chords. Yeah. I'm a champion and that's it. <laughs> no, it's got some good chords in it too. And the melody is beautiful. Did you play sports growing up? Yeah. Um, I wasn't good at them, but I loved playing. I was, <laughs> what did you I was play? Very, I was very physical. Uh, I was good at uh, – no, I wasn't good at anything. Um, I think I'm good these days, but I played uh, basketball, and then I also played soccer. That's about it. But, you know, uh, PE, I was killing it, killing it at uh, kickball and uh, capture the flag. I'm pretty fast. But yeah, and then even on tour with Postmodern Jukebox, the band that I'm a part of, uh, we toured with Postmodern Jukebox, obviously, and Straight No Chaser, this acapella group that's really great. And we would have ultimate frisbee offs because we would play these giant, giant amphitheaters, and there's usually this big patch of grass next to them, and we'd play frisbee, every competitive frisbee. It's like frisbee football, I guess, is what you'd call it. And uh, so I was good at that. But, yeah, back, back in school, no, I was always the defense. I wasn't, like, the, cool enough to be the goalie. I wasn't, you know, fast enough to do, be the, uh, the offense. I was always defense. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, what have you been up to during stuck at home, can't go do anything? Um, you know, it's kind of been a blessing in disguise. I've had some great family time. I'm here with my parents and uh, my uncles and my grandmother lives here in Arizona and uh every week I'm putting out uh, a song with a video and so it's been I've been trying to be very creative and I and I feel like I've been accomplishing it so uh tomorrow I'm gonna put out a song called funk with that and then uh and then I have another song that's called boss it's literally it's kind of like we are the champions it's it's I am a boss Mm-hmm. The first lyrics is I'm a, I am a boss, I am a king, I am the shit. <laughs> and then I go to Hollywood and party, I'm a hit. So that's like, you know, I've been I've so just been subtle. writing it's subtle, it's subtle, you know. It's it gets under the skin just just a little bit. But I, I feel it's uh it's 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 a good time to to start working on myself. Um you know, I I could I could you know, I was thinking about the alternative, you know, putting together an EP putting it out, you know, giving it a couple months, but man, this generation, you know, you got the, especially with Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, it's now, 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 now. And how do you, how do you swim above the water? You just got to keep doing now, 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 you know, sometimes I'll just sing an acapella video, a song just for 15 seconds, post it just to let people know I'm still there, you know, cause there's other people that are that are that are fighting to know to for attention you know so i i have to do the same and so yeah i I think uh i think just a a video a week and i might even do more is is really fun are you doing tiktok dance videos is that is that i've done a couple oh yeah yeah i i did uh the savage dance have you seen that i've I've Uh, not is that what the kids are doing these days (laughs) <laughs> yeah it was a couple months ago i think they've gone on to what have they gone on to some some weird dance. so for all the stuff that you're doing that's coming up where can people find you where can people be kept abreast of all things casey abrams um casey abrams music on youtube is probably the best place to go um you can support me in my art form on patreon.com slash casey abrams and that's where you can be a patron of my art and uh and people people donate their their money and and then i can put that money into making really cool videos and songs and then uh you know at casey basey you know casey base e b-a-s-s-y uh for instagram and twitter and then i am casey abrams on facebook and then oh casey basey on tiktok too that's the most important one so they can see your slick dance moves right yep they can see me twerking 
Well, if they didn't have that in their mind's eye before, they do now. Red dresses, bunny ears, twerking. Come on. This is the whole shebang. On that note, we will <laughs> we will be wrapping the show. Thank you, Casey Abrams, for joining us. Thanks a lot, Jeff. It's always good to talk to you, man. Let's do it again sometime. Stay safe out there. Much love, man. My mind just keeps running to you The minor can always change major that's what you've taught me to see.